despite the fact that Islam is geographically and ideologically Western civilization closest neighbor, it is perhaps the least understood of all the Eastern religions by the West. Islam translates to the peace that comes when one's life is surrendered to God. Although Islam as we know it today came about in the 6th century AD, their roots go back much further and can be found in the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. Just like Judaism, they believe that God created the first man, Adam, and their religious roots aligned with the Bible for most of the book of Genesis up until the story of Abraham. Abraham was chosen by God and taken out of Babylon and was commanded by God to go out in search of the promised land. And in return, he became the ancestral father of a great nation. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was unable to have children for many years. In their old age, Sarah insisted that Abraham take her handmaiden, Hagar, as a second wife, so that she could bear him a son to carry on this line. Hagar bore him Ishmael, but shortly after Sarah became pregnant and gave birth to Isaac, Sarah then demanded that Abraham banish Hagar and Ishmael so that there could be no dispute on who would go on to carry on Abraham's successor. This is the exact point where the Bible and the Quran part ways. Isaiah goes on to father the nation of Israel, and Ishmael goes to Arabia to where Mecca would one day rise, and his descendants became known as Muslims. Eventually, around the year 570 AD, the Prophet Muhammad was born. His life was filled with tragedy, and by the time he was eight years old, his entire immediate family had died. He was adopted by his uncle and put to work. Made sensitive to human suffering by his early losses, Muhammad grew up pure-hearted and was kind as well as gentle, which was somewhat of an anomaly for most of the society at the time was corrupt and immoral. As an adult, he took up work in a caravan and at the age of 25 entered the service of a wealthy widow named Khadija, who would become his wife. Muhammad would spend the next 15 years preparing for his ministry. He often frequented a cave in Mount Hira, just outside of Mecca, where he would sit alone and ponder the mystery of good and evil and reach out to God. Now, Muhammad was only interested in Allah, but it is important to note that at the time, many people in Mecca worshipped Allah. However, he was not the only God worshipped. One night, while Muhammad lay on the floor of his cave, in deep contemplation, an angel appeared before him in the form of a man. The angel bid him go forth and proclaim the glory of God. Muhammad rushed home to tell his wife what happened. He was conflicted, for he did not know if what had happened was real or if he lost his mind. His wife's faith help assured him that it was real, thus making him a prophet. His wife would be the first of many converts, a task in which he would dedicate the rest of his life to. In an age full of supernatural beliefs, Muhammad never claimed any miracles, other than writing the Quran itself. Instead, he humbly insisted that he was but a messenger sent to preach the word of God. The initial reaction to his message was mostly violently hostile because the monotheism of this message threatened the widely held polyistic beliefs, as well as challenging the social structure, which had had an unjust order and clear class distinctions. His teachings were intensely democratic. His moral teachings also demanded that promiscuous sexual practices come to an end as well, which was the opposite of what the standard of behavior was at the time. At first, the Meccan leaders just tried to laugh him off, but when they realized he wasn't going to quit, they started to insult and even threaten him. As Muhammad began to gather followers and became more of a threat, the Meccan leaders began to openly prosecute him and his followers. They would throw stones and put them in jail and try to starve them, but they were determined to carry on their message. It was a slow start. And after three grueling years of his prosecution, Muhammad only had gained 40 followers. But their faith never wavered, and they gradually grew larger and larger. As the early followers of Muhammad struggled to hang on in Mecca, 
they were surprised by a visit of some leaders of the distant city of Yathrib. Muhammad's teachings had unknowingly made their way to the city and won a firm hold there. They agreed to worship Allah only and to convert to Islam and recognize him as a prophet if in return he'd come to be their leader and guide the city to peace. In the year 622 AD, Muhammad accepted their offer and immigrated to Yathrib, a city that later became known as the city of the prophet. While there, he became more of a politician than a prophet and lived a humble life and ran the city well. His administration was a perfect blend of justice and mercy. He was able to bring peace among the many tribes living there. Shortly after bringing the city into an order, the Meccan army attacked. In an attempt to halt Muhammad's growing influence, the Meccan army was miraculously defeated and forced to retreat. But they would attack again the following year and win a devastating victory, where even Muhammad himself was wounded. Two years later, the Meccans laid siege to his city to try and finish him off in a desperate effort to put a stop to the growing Muslim population. But this time, they were fully defeated. And Muhammad returned to Mecca, a conqueror eight years after fleeing as a persecuted fugitive. While there, Muhammad converted Mecca to Islam and established the worship of Allah. He soon afterwards returned to his city and spent the rest of his life there. By the time he died, he had united all of Arabia, a feat that had never been done before. Islam spread to the surrounding areas and took over as a major religion. By the end of the century, his followers had conquered Armenia, Persia, Syria, Palestine, Iraq, North Africa, Spain, and even parts of France. If it wasn't for their defeat by Charles Martel in 733 AD, in the Battle of Tours, the entire Western world might have been Muslim today. Islam remains one of the most biggest religions today, and Muhammad is widely regarded as one of the most influential people of all time. Muslims do not view Muhammad as God, and therefore do not worship him. It is the Quran itself is the center of their faith. The writing of the Quran is the only miracle that was ever attributed to Muhammad. Muslims believe that the Quran was dictated by divine forces and Muhammad is credited with writing it all down. Hence the literal translation of Quran, which means recitation. Muhammad completed the Quran over the course of 23 years where he would intermittently be seized by an angelic presence who later revealed himself to be the Archangel Gabriel and told him exactly what to write. Unlike the Bible, the Quran does not put emphasis on historical accounts, but rather it focuses on the proclamations of Allah and why he should be praised. In other words, the Bible is written in third person, explaining to the reader what happened, whereas the Quran is written in first person and it is Allah himself speaking and making his laws known. Islam is a monotheistic religion, believing that there is only one God who is immaterial and invisible that created all things. It is similar in many ways to Judaism, and even they recognize Jesus as a prophet and believe in the virgin birth. However, they do not believe that Jesus was the son of God. Instead, they believed that Jesus and Adam were the only two men to be directly created by God. Above all things, the Quranic description of God stresses his awesome, fear-inspiring power. Muslims believe that God is omnipotent and should be feared. This fear is not to be confused with terror. However, it is more akin with the utmost respect for they believe that how one acts in life matters. If one ignores God's commands, it would end in disaster. This is not to say that Allah is a cruel God either, for they also believe in his mercy. He is ever present and guides the faithful, even when they stray away from the path and make mistakes. 
Islam states that Allah created the heavens and the earth, which places equal importance on the material world and the spiritual one. Muslims believe that the material world is important and ultimately good. This is perhaps why science emerged in the Muslim world before its Western counterpart. Next, Allah created humanity. Although they believe in the story of Adam and Eve, they do not believe in the concept of original sin. The closest concept they have to original sin is hafal, which means forgetting. In other words, as humans, we have a tendency to forget our divine origin, which means people are fundamentally good, but need constant reminding of their divine nature. After acknowledging that life is a gift from their creator, Muslims believe that there are two major obligations to God, the first being gratitude. The term infidel is commonly mistranslated to non-believer. However, the original meaning is closer to ungrateful. The second obligation is part of the name Islam itself. One should surrender their will to the power of God. Surrender may have a negative connotation in today's day and age, but considering peace is the byproduct of this surrender, there is nothing negative about it. This is why Abraham is one of the most important figures in the Quran. For he passed God's ultimate test. When he surrendered to his will and would have sacrificed his son if not for God's mercy, unlike many other Eastern religions that practice meditation to overcome all sense of self, Islam puts an emphasis on the individuality of the human soul, believing it to be unique and divinely created. The Quran presents life as a brief and precious opportunity to make the right choices. For they believe, in the end, the soul will be judged on the choices it made, and these choices will determine its final resting place, heaven or hell. Interestingly enough, they do not believe that God is who judges these souls and punishes them, but rather it's the soul itself that passes the judgment. Islam has five major principles that act as pillars to support the faith. The first pillar being their creed, known as Shahada, simple and to the point. Their creed is, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. The second pillar is the ritual of prayer as prescribed in the Quran. Muslims pray five times a day on their knees, bowing before the awesome power of God. The timing of these prayers is also designated upon awakening around noon, midday, sunset, and finally before going to bed. No matter where they are in the world, they are to face whatever direction Mecca is in while praying. The third pillar is charity, which designates that 2.5% of one's income should be donated directly to the poorest, neediest people. The fourth pillar is the observance of Ramadan, a holy month where Muslims must fast from dusk to dawn in order to practice self-discipline and symbolizes one's dependence on God above all other things. The fifth and final pillar is pilgrimage. Every Muslim that is physically and financially able is decreed to visit the holy city of Mecca at least once in their lifetime. The history of Islam is intricately intertwined with the world's history itself. As it is spread all over the globe, today there are more than 900 million people that identify as Muslim, of all which to testify that there is no God but God.